When we gather together, we know that here is a place where everyone is welcome. And uh, I add my welcome to Graham's from a little earlier on. To those who visit us, a very special welcome to you. Thank you for including this service in your program while you're holidaying here on the island. And if you're new to the island, but if you're new to the church here, but been living on the island some time, a very warm welcome to you. Some years ago there was a book, I remember reading about it on occasions, and so I looked it up thinking about what I was going to say this morning. There was this book called The Worst Case Scenario Survival Handbook. It's a little book, it was very, very popular uh, when it came out. Uh, it talked about all sorts of uh, things that probably would never happen, uh, but it was there to help us to know how to respond when these things happen. One of them was, uh, <coughs> uh, what should you do uh, if you jump out of an aeroplane and your parachute doesn't open? <laughs> now, I, I guess we could, we could get Russell up to tell us. He probably learned about that when he was in the Air Force. <laughs> what do you do when your parachute doesn't open? And uh, they were actually given... Uh, some choices on what they should do and uh, then they explained what's the best thing to do. Um, I actually put this here, if your parachute fails to open just remember you for the rest of your life to fix it. <laughs> I thought, yep, that's about right isn't it? You better get on with it in a hurry because it's not going to be long. <laughs> but actually the, the final recommendation is, um, is to, uh, to signal to your, another fellow uh, parachutists to come over near. Apparently they can actually fly around and control where they go. And then you grab hold of him and you whip your arms through his harness and grab your harness and hang on. Remember you're dropping out of the sky at something like about 300 kilometres an hour and uh, when you finally, his chute opens, if you don't get ripped off and fall to the ground to your death, uh, when you land it will be a fairly solid landing. You may well break your arms and maybe your spine and so I thought I should let the church know that, just in case. The best advice I can give you is don't go parachuting. Now, we know, we know someone in the church who did. Her name's Elma Allen. Uh, she's, uh, didn't you go parachuting? In a hot air balloon. Oh, well, there you go. I thought you got yourself strapped to somebody and, they, and jumped out of an aeroplane. I thought very highly of you, Alma, all these years <laughs> because she was over 80 when she did this and I thought, wow, probably over 90 actually, and I thought, wow. But your mum did too, did she? But here's another one. What should you do if confronted by an angry mountain lion? Here's the choices. A, run. B, play dead. C, make yourself look bigger by opening your coat. Or D, say a gentle, happy song. <laughs> Farewell, world. <laughs> the correct answer is make yourself look bigger by opening your coat. That's the... Oh, not me. I'm just glad I don't have angry lions uh, around here. And they said, if there's a child nearby, what should you do? And I thought, outrun the child. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's not the answer. It's pick up the child and he's got to open his coat too and look bigger still. And if any of you ever saw that, that uh, you know, those little um, uh, hill people in, in, in Africa? What was that? What was that? Bush the bush people. And, and the little guy, remember the little guys in the film? There was two films, weren't they? The little guys, when the wolf came or the hyenas came, and uh, he actually put a stick up above his head to look bigger. Do you remember that? Maybe it's the same sort of thing. Well, the survival guide is, uh, is an important issue, and we need a survival guide too. When life throws you a curveball, what should you do? And the answer, I, I understand just reading about it, that you can actually throw a baseball so that it actually curves in the air. You can actually bowl a cricket ball that way wrong too, can't you? so that it will, will uh, either swing one way or the other? Well, the answer from America is hit it out of the park. That's what you should do. And, and I thought about that and thought, yes, in life we all have curled curveballs. We all have things that happen that deeply trouble us 
and we don't know how to respond to them. The uh, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20 is where Paul reminds us that no matter what's happening in our life, God is able. He is able to come alongside to help. Here's the verse, verse 20, 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or think or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. The God whom we love and serve is able, as it says here, to do immeasurably more than we ask or think. When the curveball comes, when, when we feel that we've lost control of what's happening in our life, when our hearts are burdened and heavy, I believe we should turn to God to seek his face, to seek his help. If we're grieving, to seek his comfort. If we are weak, to seek his strength. If we're filled with doubt, to increase our faith. We look to God to be there for us. God is able. And the, the story, it's just that I've been looking at different stories in the Bible about God's ability and how men and women of God responded to the crises of life. And, and I believe that God had them there. Do you know, the Old Testament isn't just telling us Jewish history. You know, there are life principles there that are for us here and now, 2,000 years the other, the, on this side of Christ. The one that I want to take us to this morning is found in Daniel chapter 3. Uh, we have, if we had been reading the passage, we would already know about Daniel and the lion's den and his desire to honour God and to pray and how he ended up in a lion's den and God closed the lion's mouths and the next uh, morning uh, when the king came along he was still alive God can close a lion's mouth and I, I, I have no party with those who say no that was just an Old Testament miracle it was an Old Testament miracle but the God whom we love and serve is still the God of the miraculous there's no doubt about that. Well, these three men um, were, were three men who faced a, a real-life challenge. They faced a curveball uh, that uh, in their day had far-reaching ramifications. We will also face challenges in our lives. And when those challenges come, we need to know how to respond. Here's the story. I'll tell you their names. Well, can you tell me their names? Shadrach, Meshach and off to bed you go. Did you say, did you say that, Joan? Ah, three men, three Jewish men. By the way, they were uh, educated young men. They were, they were fine young men. They were upright young men. They were in Jerusalem, they were in Israel, when the country was overrun and many of the population, you know, the educated ruling classes, were all carried off into Babylon as slaves. Daniel was amongst them. These three men was amongst them. They arrived in Babylon in chains. But when they got there, the king had some plans for them and so he actually um, uh, put them in a place where they could receive training. Uh, he was feeding them the best food and you might remember uh, these young men decided that they were just going to be vegetarian. Now all the vegetarians in the congregation, you're allowed to cheer now because this is, this is your page, isn't it? But uh, they said, uh, we will not eat the delicacies of Babylon. And, uh, and uh, they were concerned, those who were in charge of them. Uh, but they, uh, they acceded to the request and uh, there was none wiser there was none more handsome than these these men there came a time that's not really what the story is about this morning there came a time though when the king determined that he was going to build this great big image now bible uh, scholars love uh, to look at the prophecy of this great image uh, i'm not proposing to go there this morning but i note that this golden image was 27 meters high 
and almost three metres wide. It was a big, it was a really big edifice that had been built and it was put out on this particular plane. And uh, it, it was uh, really a reminder of the greatness of the Babylonian Empire and indeed of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar himself. When it was complete, the instruction went out that people from every tribe, every race, every language group should come to this great uh, dedication. And, uh, and uh, so uh, these three men and, uh, were there, Daniel was there, and uh, lots of others, I guess. Well, literally crowds were there for this event. I sort of think, what, what would it be like? Probably something like... I was going to say the opening of the Olympic Games, you know, it was a very big international event. Almost as big as the World FIFA World Cup soccer, if anyone's been into that. And so the instructions for the day were the... Oh, I'll just go back there. You know, God-sized challenges need God-sized solutions. And this was going to be a real challenge for these, these three young men. I, I believe and this is a John Gollanism, so you can ignore it altogether, but I believe that either Daniel wasn't there for some reason or he was the fourth one who wasn't doing what uh, everyone else was doing, but because he wouldn't have been bowing down to it either. But the instructions went out, it was given to everyone, they had all these musicians there with all the different musical instruments, uh, with their horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, and all kinds of music. All the nations and peoples of every language were there. This verse uh, 7 of Daniel chapter 3. It was quite an event. And the instruction was that when the music played that the people were to bow down before the image and pay homage to the image that, that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Do you know, just thinking about it and how does it relate to today? Because the word of God needs to relate to today. God-sized challenges need God-sized solutions. We need to measure the rules of our society by the word of God. We too are faced with a situation of faith compromise in the culture in which we live today. That's a reality. I think about that sometimes when I look back over the generations of Gollans that have lived and I have a sneaky idea that my great-grandparents and definitely my great-great-grandparents, they would be aghast at what they would consider to be the worldliness of my generation. You know, the compromise, the conditioning of a culture that is not godly. And we're seeing it everywhere. By the way, there are some good things in our culture that weren't there in the culture of my forebears either. But uh, there is that challenge that will come. It was so in New Testament times when the Apostle Paul uh, came along and he said, listen, in Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you, I plead with you by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. And the next verse says, verse 2, we don't normally quote verse 2, verse 2 says, and don't let the world push you into its mold. Why? Because the world wants to push us in to its mould. The worldly order wants us to be like the world. They don't want us to be different. They want us to simply roll over. And that was what was being faced here. Uh, that here was a law and, and the law carried a dreadful penalty. For anyone who did not bow down when the music played, there was a fiery furnace reserved for them. And so... The Bible tells us in uh, chapter 3 of the book of Daniel, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp and all kinds of music, all the nations and people of every language, do you know what they did? They fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. In fact, just reading, not between the lines, I think it's an application of the lines, it was almost as though the mob couldn't get down fast enough. <laughs> you know, they couldn't roll over fast enough. They were accepting that. Ladies and gentlemen, as God's holy people, 
we ought not simply to accept the values and standards of our culture. We should question them. And we should stand for what is true and holy and right. It's that, it's that simple, really. The astrologers were quick to point out to Nebuchadnezzar. The word got back to his ears quickly that there were three men who didn't bear down. You can imagine here, everyone on their faces, you know, uh, before this image, paying homage to uh, this image and all that it represented. And here were three men just standing there. They weren't half bowing. They weren't trying to get away, go and hide behind something. They simply stood there. They stood out. You know, as I thought about that, when we make a stand for God, you'll soon stand out. <laughs> Because that's what happened here. But, but friends, we need to be sure that when we stand out, we're standing out for the right thing, not the wrong thing. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Robin and I were talking about this yesterday and saying that, you know, I go on Facebook and I hear some of the comments that are being made by people who are professing to stand for the truth. And, and if I could listen to the heart of what's on the Facebook, I find a hard, critical spirit heart. You know, we're not thumbing our nose at our culture. We are determined to stand for God. We are determined to stand for truth. But we want to do it in a gracious way. A godly way. These men made a stand for, for what they believed to be godly and right. And it was noticed. Didn't take long, as I said, for the news to get to Nebuchadnezzar. The uh, astrologers rushed on down there. They couldn't let King Nebuchadnezzar know quickly enough. It says they came forward and denounced the Jews. So there was a critical bit. There was a critical spirit there. Look at them. Look what they're doing. You know they're against you. Whether it was whether they were driven by envy, we don't know. Maybe they were because these men were were godly in their rule, godly in their leadership. <coughs> You'll soon find, if you make a stand for God, that there'll be someone there to criticise you, someone to point the finger at you. And I don't know, I guess we've all heard it, haven't we? There, the, uh, there are people who uh, will say about us as Christians, oh, you think you're better than we are, don't you? You think you're a holy roller, aren't you? you know? And I say, no, I'm a sinner. You think you're better than us? No, we're not better than anybody. But we've found an answer, a significant answer, that's changed our lives. We've found God to be real. We've found him to be a, a holy and just God, yes, but a God who's full of compassion and kindness and love and he comes alongside us. It's just good news that we've got to share. We're not pointing the finger at you at all. It's interesting to me, one of, the, one of my most favourite New Testament stories is when Jesus met the woman who had been caught in adultery. You know, she had been brought, you know, this woman, you know, what a wicked woman, the religious set were saying, you know, what, what do you say? And they said, well, you know, we know what the law says, she should be stoned to death. And, uh, and Jesus uh, simply knelt down and started to write on the ground, write something in the ground. And, uh, and uh, he just said, simply said, as he started this, he said, you who are without sin cast the first stone. And he's writing, writing. And then he looks up and he says to a woman, where are your accusers? And she said, they've all gone, Lord. They've all gone. Neither do I condemn you, Jesus said. Neither do I. That sticks in our heart, doesn't it? Neither do I condemn you, says Jesus. Go. Don't sin anymore. We're not told. But we would believe that that lady's life was changed irrevocably at that moment of time. The very fact that she said, she didn't say they've all gone, Rabbi. They didn't say they've all gone, sir. They said they've all gone, Lord. <laughs> There's something happened there. Something wonderful happened in her life. Some of the commentators, and again, it's reading between the lines, some of the commentators say, what did, wonder what Jesus wrote. And I'm always interested to find that out someday, but some have suggested that he was probably writing the secret sins of all the Pharisees, the religious said who were pointing the finger. And when they saw their sin in the ground, whoops, I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah. No, 
we, we stand for truth. There will be some criticism. And if you don't want the criticism, don't stand for truth, I suppose. But that's no answer, is it? When we come to know the Lord in a real and in a personal way. So they were brought. The Bible actually tells us that when uh, King Nebuchadnezzar... I'll just read it. The, king, they said to the, the astrologers said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Gee, they butted him up. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp and pipe and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. That whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. There are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, Abed, Nego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image that you've set up. And look at Nebuchadnezzar's response, verse 13. Filled with rage, furious with rage, one translation says. They were summoned. And, uh, and he said, is it true? Is it true that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I have set up? Now, he said, I'm going to give you a second chance. When you hear the music, bow down now, you know. Hey, this is where the rubber hits the road. Bow down. If you don't, you'll be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? You see, Nebuchadnezzar had a problem, didn't he? He thought that it was all about him and his power. Watch out for people who are filled, who are drunk for power. Whether that be in our society, in our world, or even in the church. That's why we continually speak here about servant leadership. Servant leadership is what we seek. That's godly servant leadership. And, um, you know, if, if you think about the tragedies that are going on in the world today, you think about Ukraine, you think about the Middle East and this uh, 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 Islamic state that's being set up based on fear through the barrel of a gun, it is so, so far away from what God has planned. And so here, here was Nebuchadnezzar. You know, set, you know, worship the image I'll set up or it's, it's one flash in your ash, guys. And, and they responded in such a beautiful way. O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O oh king. What a wonderful response in that situation. Do you know, what they were really saying was that God is able. We'll go back and do that again. God is able. My God is able. I wonder if you believe your God is able to deliver you. Is your God able to save you? Well, they went on and went a step further than that and they said this, but even if he does not, we have already decided, we've made up our mind, in the face of the worst case scenario, even if he does, we want you to know something, O king, we will not serve your gods. We will not worship the image of gold that you have set up. You see, I don't know how much they had thought about it beforehand. Perhaps they had, they might have had a conversation about it. Maybe they believed the king wouldn't throw them into the fiery furnace, that because they were respected, that they would be spared. But they were very definite in their position. We want you to know something. God is able to save us. He will deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we are not going to compromise on this position. We are not going to dishonour God in order that we might honour you. There is the place. And so they were taken and cast into the fiery furnace. And uh, the Bible tells us uh, that they, they heated it up much hotter than it was and people who were, who were uh, heating it up, the people who threw them in were perished uh, and uh, the king looked in and saw not three men but four. And the fourth man wasn't Daniel. 
is believed that the, the fourth man was indeed a theophany. And they came out. And when they came out, the Bible actually says not a head of their hair was singed. They didn't even smell of smoke. You see, it raises the issue for our attention, doesn't it? We declare God is able to save us. God is able to deliver us. God is able to help us. But what will we do if he doesn't? <laughs> what will we do if he doesn't? It reminds me of stories in the Bible and time's gone, so I'm just going to flick through them. You know this guy? Joseph. Joseph and his coat of many colours. If we were to go through his life story, it's a really encouraging story, but challenging too. Here is Joseph, who ultimately became the Prime Minister of Egypt, arrived as a slave, honoured God again and again and again, took a stand against the philosophy of the culture of his day, and ultimately as the Prime Minister of Egypt, with his brothers now before him, bowing before him, when they found out who he was, they were scared witless. And he ultimately, with tears, said to them, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. They were afraid. They thought the boom was going to be lowered. He said, don't be afraid. What you did, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Does that take us to a verse in Romans chapter 8? It does, doesn't it? Quite clearly it takes us to that verse in Romans chapter 8. That God works all things together for the good of those who love him to those who are called according to God's purpose. Actually, God's dealings with Joseph ultimately left, led to the salvation not only of Egypt but of his family and future generations. So there's Joseph. Here's another one, a young woman, a beautiful young woman uh, who... Um, um, I was going to say, uh, unlike Bill, where the church decided who he should marry... <laughs> this was the king's choice and he had chosen this young woman to uh, come into his harem she was a beautiful young woman her name was Esther a name I particularly like I might tell you <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the, there was an evil man by the name of Haman who wanted to destroy the Jewish nation <clears throat> and what actually happened was the, uh, his uh, uh, a relative of Esther's came to him, his name was Mordecai, and he said, listen, you've got to go to the king, you've got to go. And she said, but if I go in unbidden, I'll die. And he said, well, if you don't go in, we all die. <laughs> this is my John Gollan storytelling. You know? And so she decided that she would. There was one hope, that is, that when she came in unbidden, that the king would, Ahasuerus would, hold out his scepter towards her and she would not die. But she didn't know that. And as she prayed, and as she sought the face of God, she said, I will go to the king, oh, even though it's against the law, and if I perish, I perish. You know, there was faith there, there was a trust there, a willingness to submit no matter what the cost. Now very quickly, one other... So I say, it's a, it's a biblical pattern. It happens again and again and again. A rich man who became poor, whose health was affected, his children lost, all his possessions gone. And a wife who said to him, curse God and die. This man, the Bible says, maintained his integrity before God. His friends came along and they made all sorts of suggestions to him about why he was in this sad state. And ultimately, he came to the place where he said this, though he slay me, Yet will I trust him. He said to God, even if you slay me, even if you slay me, I'm going to trust you. No matter what, I'm going to trust you. Job 13, 15, it's verse 15, if you want to jot that down anywhere. Though God slay me, yet will I trust him. You see, all of these, and these are only a hand-picked few. I, I haven't included, and I, I would have liked to have, I'd like to have included Jesus. Here was Jesus facing the cross and in the garden. He says, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. You see, it's a pattern. It's a pattern. 
The Bible says that God is our refuge and strength. He's a very present help in time of trouble. Whatever the trouble is that you're facing, friends, God is there and he is equal <coughs> to every trouble. He's greater than your troubles. It's wonderful when he wonderfully delivers us in a situation. We all have stories we can tell where that's been the case. Uh, we read about them. But you know there are many people who were not delivered. You read Hebrews chapter 11. <laughs> you know, many of the saints of God were put to the sword. They were cut in two, sawn asunder. You know, they, were, they, were, they were desecrated. Not all were delivered. No, they were all delivered. They were all delivered. There was a man in America... Uh, Windsor was his name. He was a pastor and, and he believed that God would have them start a Christian school in the church and that they should not ask the government for permission to do what God had commanded them to do. And uh, the local education board, because it's a county situation in America, a bit different to Australia, uh, came along and put pressure on him because they wanted the kids in that school in their schools. And, uh, and uh, they said, no, 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 we won't do this, we won't do this. And then the sheriff came along and, and uh, threatened them. And, uh, and they uh, ultimately took them out of the church and padlocked the, the door so that they couldn't get in. And he said, we will continue. We will continue to do what is honouring to God. We will continue to do what pleases God. We will not allow our children to be educated in a system that is godless. And, um, and so he was arrested. And he was taken down to the uh, police station and they interrogated him and they threatened him. And one of them said to him, he said, Pastor, do you realise that we hold in our hands life and death for you? You could die. And he said to them, you can't threaten me with heaven. You think about that. You think about that. You see, even those who did not survive, God has a wonderful heaven there for his people. And I often think about that when I go to hospital and here's a person in uh, a uh, terminally ill condition and someone has come along and said, if you have enough faith, you can be healed. And, uh, and they say, I must be such a worthless Christian because I'm not being healed. And I say, listen, listen. That's not good Bible knowledge. Not good Bible knowledge. The reality is that when God calls you home, you will be forever healed. <laughs> You'll be forever healed in a place where there is no sickness, no sadness, no sorrow, no tears, no death, no pain. You see, let us determine by the grace of God that we'll stand for him. Let God be enough for our every day. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together this morning. Thank you for the encouragement that is there, that in the midst of tragedy and crisis, there is comfort, there is encouragement, there is help. And we thank you, Father, for the examples that come from the word this morning. Your word that reminds us that the faith of these men and of these women is such that they determined they were going to trust you regardless of the circumstances and find you to be their sufficiency. So we pray for each other. Whatever the need might be in our life, may we find that satisfied completely with you in Jesus' name. Amen.